Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Christy and today I want to talk about Paul. The Paul, the Apostle Paul, the I had a vision on the road to Damascus and now my life has changed and I'm no longer persecuting and killing Christians, but now I am a mouthpiece for Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been following me on TikTok for a while, you probably already know I've got some beef with Paul. I'm not a big fan, okay? <laughs> I don't like the guy. I don't trust him. I don't like his writings. And I don't think that he was really aligned with what was written about Jesus. I think they were teaching completely different messages. And it is my opinion that if Christians spent more time comparing the words of Jesus and the words of Paul, I think that they might have a lot of questions for Paul. And they might even see him as one of the false prophets that Jesus warned against. And the reason I say this is because in Matthew 24, Jesus warned of false prophets. Jesus was talking about the destruction of the temple and the signs of the end times. It says uh, in verse one, Jesus left the temple and was walking away and his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. He says, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And his disciples say, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So his disciples want to know what to look for. What signs should we be on the lookout for, for the end times? And, you know, Jesus answers. And he says, first of all, before anything else, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and many will and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, all of the signs. But he starts out with a very important statement Watch out, nobody deceives you. People are going to come, they're going to trick you, they're going to deceive you, and they're going to lead people astray. So be on the lookout for those people. And then in verse 11, after he kind of discusses, you know, some of the things that they'll experience, like earthquakes and violence and war, in verse 11, he says, again, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And then again, in verse 23, he reiterates it and he says, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. This is loaded because if you think about Paul and who Paul was, he came on scene very early and he was persecuting these followers of the way as it was called in the beginning. It was not Christianity, it was the way. And he was persecuting these people and then he had a, 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 a vision. He had an experience where Jesus, uh, you know, came to him and basically changed his life and told him to turn from those ways and, and, and decided to make him a mouthpiece for Jesus. So that's what Paul is claiming. But if you listen to Jesus, he's saying, hey, be, be careful. People are going to come through and they're going to claim to be me or, you know, claim to speak for me. And they're going to deceive a lot of people. I would consider Paul to be someone who deceived a lot of people. If he wasn't preaching the true message, then a lot of people were deceived by Paul. Because Paul, he was responsible for kind of the spread of Christianity. And I think it's interesting that Jesus says that false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive. Paul cast out demons, he performed miracles, he, he performed several miracles according to the text, according to the New Testament. And so he's checking the boxes, right? Like he comes on scene, he, in Galatians 2.20, which was my favorite, favorite Bible verse in my teenage years, I had it painted above my bed. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So he is making a statement about how he has essentially died and Jesus took over. And now the one that's living through him is Jesus. So he's essentially propping himself up to be on the same level of Jesus. And it's so funny how so many Christians see this as um, kind of an act of humility when you die to yourself and let Jesus live through you. And I think that what they're doing is they're actually putting themselves on the level of Jesus and they're claiming that this isn't me, this is Jesus. Who I am now, who you perceive when you talk to me and interact with me is Jesus. It's not me, it's Jesus. <laughs> like, that's exactly what pastors are doing. That's what people are doing when they say, like, I've died to myself and Jesus lives in me. You're basically calling yourself Christ. You, you really are. And so, again, Paul is kind of propping himself up as, as Jesus. He's performing signs and wonders. It even says that he will lead astray as many as possible, even the elect. Now, 
I think the elect, according to Jesus, was the Jews because Jesus was a Jew. He was forming his own kind of Jewish cult. Uh, he followed the Jewish religion and that's that's what he was there to minister. He was there to minister to the Jews according to his own words. But then Paul comes along and he starts ministering to the Gentiles. And a lot of the people, a lot of the Jewish people that were a part of this movement didn't like that. They didn't want the Gentiles to be welcomed in. And you see a lot of people leaving in the earliest days. That's why you have texts about, you know, oh, if they went out from us, they were never a part of us in the beginning because people were leaving the faith in the very beginning. And so it's interesting that if, uh, you know, the elect were the Jews, according to Jesus, and he's saying that the elect will be led astray and leaving in the beginning because they were inviting all these other people in, well, then a check, you have another box checked. And so if you consider that, if you consider that Paul is checking the boxes of false prophets and Jesus was so eager to warn against these false prophets, let's just pretend for a minute we'll work within the hypothetical framework that Jesus was God, that Jesus was who he, you know, claimed to be or who the, the church claims him to be, that he was actually making a prophecy and he was prophesying that there would be these false prophets. Well, Paul checks that box, every box, and then some, because not only is he checking those boxes, performing signs and wonders, casting out demons, deceiving people, driving away the elect, not only is he doing all of that, but he's also teaching of completely different message than Jesus taught. He's adding to the message a lot even. And sure, if you believe that Jesus spoke to Paul and is speaking through Paul, then you know, you can say that it is the message of Jesus. But anybody can say that Jesus is speaking through them. Pastors do it all the time. Just because Paul claims that he had a vision of Jesus doesn't mean that he actually did. And you know, people will argue that he, his life changed and all that. I think that there could have been a lot of motives for why Paul did what he did, but I'll save that for another video. Maybe I'll do a whole video on why I think Paul is not trustworthy and kind of deep dive into Paul because it's, it is a fascinating subject. He is a very mysterious character of the Bible to me. Um, and so I have a lot of thoughts on him. But what I want to do now is I want to look over the contradictions between his teachings and Jesus. There are a lot of contradictions between their teachings, but there are also a lot of contradictions between their own teachings, right? So Paul contradicts himself. We see Jesus contradicting himself when he says to love others and to just love people. But then he says, you have to hate your whole family to follow him. So we're seeing a lot of discrepancies between their own teachings. So it's kind of it's hard to say that they contradict one another when they also contradict themselves. But I do want to kind of look at some of the teachings of Jesus, some of the teachings of Paul, and let's let's put them together and let's see if they could even be compatible with one another. Starting in Matthew 23, 8 through 10, Jesus says, You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. So I think it's pretty clear that Jesus is telling his disciples that they are not teachers. They are not instructors. They are not to prop themselves up to be in that position of authority over other people teaching them things. Uh, to me, that's pretty clear here. But 1 Timothy 2.7, Paul says, for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying, says a person who is not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So right there, he's calling himself a teacher. He very much considers him a, himself a teacher, that he spends his letters teaching people how to be Christian. And so it's so interesting to me that Jesus is very specifically says, you are not a teacher, you are not an instructor, you were to be a humble servant. <laughs> that is your ministry. And then Paul comes on scene immediately and he starts teaching. He starts building churches and teaching them on how to be and giving them rules for how to live. Jesus didn't say to do that. And he didn't say, hey, I'm gonna send someone after my death to come along and be your teacher. He didn't say that. He didn't prophesy Paul at all. I would be more convinced that Paul was who he said he was if Jesus had prophesied that Paul was going to come on scene, but he never did. Jesus never said anything about Paul or even implied that there would be a Paul to come on scene after he was gone to continue his teachings. You'd think, Jesus would have clarified that. 
Our second contradiction comes in Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name drive out demons, and your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So he has said, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's pretty clear. But Paul says in Romans 10, verse 13, which he is, he's uh, quoting Joel 2.32, but he says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's basically saying, like, no matter who you are, if you call on God, you will be saved. But if you look in Matthew 7, Jesus says, not everyone who calls on my name will be saved. So we see conflicting reports here. Our third contradiction comes in Romans 9, where Paul says, Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. To me, this is a, a very clear indication that the Calvinists got it right, although a lot of people would disagree with me. But it does say that God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And if he decides he doesn't want to have mercy on you, he's not going to have mercy on you. But Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. If you are merciful toward others... God will show you mercy. If you forgive others, God will forgive you. Jesus says that multiple times. So Jesus is saying that all you have to do in order to receive mercy is to be merciful to other people. Now this does contradict other things that Jesus says. To me, it even contradicts John 3, 16, where it says whoever believes in God will be saved. You have to believe. The belief is such an important part of it. But here Jesus is saying if you show mercy, God is going to show you mercy. Do unto others and God will do to you. But Paul is not saying that. Paul does not reiterate that point. He doesn't say be merciful to others and God will be merciful to you. He says God is going to have mercy on you if he wants to. Now in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, Jesus talks about not coming to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He says, for truly I tell, to you, tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who set aside one of the least of these commands and teaching teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And I feel as though Jesus spends so much of his ministry saying, be kind, do the good works, do good things for other people, love others, care for others, be merciful, be compassionate, be humble, be all of the good qualities, do those things you will be righteous and you will be called into the kingdom of God. But Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, of course, Paul makes other statements about works versus faith and, you know, faith without works is dead. And I, again, he contradicts himself, but he specifically says it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And I think this theme just occurs over and over and over again throughout Paul's writings. It's all about the resurrection of Jesus, having faith in Jesus, obeying Jesus. It's all about the belief in who Jesus is and what he did. And that is what saves you. That is your saving grace. Whereas Jesus spent so much of his ministry not saying, believe in me, he said it very, very few times. He said, he said, do the will of my father, which is what I'm telling you, these rules, you know, be kind, be loving, show compassion to others, do the works. That is how you are saved. Paul says, have faith. That's how you are saved. Now in Mark 10, six through nine, Jesus says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It says, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and be united to his wife. So Jesus is insisting that there is this kind of sacred, divine expectation that people will get married and they will become one flesh and they will honor God through that because that is the reason the two genders were created. According to Jesus, <laughs> that's what Jesus is saying. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7 through 8, Paul says, I wish that all of you were as I am, which is celibate <laughs> because Paul couldn't get any, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. 
So Paul is insisting that people should be celibate. They should not get married. He is not perpetuating this idea that there is this kind of sacred expectation from God that you are supposed to come together as one and be married. I do think it's so interesting that, that Paul has uh, decided to stay unmarried and uh, he thinks that that is just the path that everyone should take since he has too. <laughs> you know, if I can't do it, you can either. <laughs> Our next contradiction comes Matthew 544. Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And this goes on. I don't want you to retaliate. I don't want you to be angry and bitter toward people who don't agree with you or aren't of you or, you know, your enemies, even if they are your enemies, don't, don't hate them. Turn the other cheek, pray for them. But Paul comes along and in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse, as we have already said. So now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. He basically just, he just repeats it. Like he, this is so important to him that if somebody else is preaching something different than Paul is, because Paul has the right gospel and everybody else has the wrong gospel, which is a very convenient thing to tell people when you want to make sure that they don't listen to anyone else and they just do whatever you say. Paul says, if, if anybody else preaching a different gospel, God will curse them. I want them to be cursed by God. I am an invoking God's curse upon them. I would argue that invoking curses upon people that are just simply teaching a different gospel than you, they're not even your enemy, but they're just, they're, sharing a different message than you is is quite a stretch from love and pray for your enemies. I, I would say that praying for and cursing are probably like, I think they're like polar opposites, you know? <laughs> I don't think that you can curse someone and pray for them and love them at the same time. Paul comes on scene right after Jesus and instead of loving his enemies, he just curses all of them. Now, the last one I wanna present is not as clear of a contradiction, but I do think that the attitude and the teaching of Paul in this specific scenario is so different than the attitude of Jesus. And that is how Paul treats women and what he thinks of women. In Jesus's ministry, he, he interacted with many women. And in the book of John, after the resurrection or at the, the resurrection, uh, Jesus in verse 17 says to Mary Magdalene, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said these things to her. So when Jesus allegedly resurrects, he entrusts a woman to go and tell people what happened, to tell men what happened. Jesus is not putting men and women on these, these different levels. Jesus is kind of seeing everybody as equal. And in fact, I feel like he elevates women a lot throughout the writings. I'm not Jesus's biggest fan, but I can recognize that he was good to women. He didn't see women as weak or incapable. And he appeared to a woman and told that woman to go and tell, tell people what happened. Tell my disciples. That is a very big stretch from 1 Timothy 2.12, where he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Where in any of Jesus's teachings did he indicate that women specifically were not allowed to teach, have authority over a man, and that they were to remain quiet? He didn't. He didn't share that message. And you'd think that if Paul was just continuing the message of Jesus, that Jesus would have said something like this, but he didn't. He showed no indication of seeing women as the weaker vessel. He showed no indication of, of, of you know, not wanting women to speak up. You know, he, he didn't tell women to be quiet. He told Mary Magdalene, go out and tell people, talk, speak. But Paul comes along and he's like, we need to make sure that women stay quiet and, and women cannot be teaching over men, which, assumes that men can be teaching men, men can be teachers, even though like we saw before, Jesus says, don't call people a teacher. You are not a teacher. You must be a humble servant. He wanted people to be servants. He washed feet for his sake. I was going to say Christ's sakes, but you know, <laughs> anyway, what a far leap from any of the teachings that we read about from Jesus in the Gospels. Now, is it possible that there are teachings that didn't make the Gospels that were being, you know, passed on as, as oral tradition and Paul heard those and that's what he was going off of? 
maybe. And Jesus didn't make sure to specify, hey, make sure, make sure you treat women as kind of second class. That's really important to me. So Paul is adding to the words of Jesus. He's making up his own rules. And to me, these all feel so contradictory to the overall theming, the overall message of Jesus according to the Gospels. To me, reading the words of Jesus and then reading the words of Paul, the two, I feel like they butt heads. <laughs> Who's gonna win, Jesus or, or Paul? Uh, well, I know who won out in the modern church and that's Paul. Paul won out because the churches love to quote Paul more than they love to quote Jesus. They, they love using the rules and the regulations and all the things that Paul told them to do and Paul told them to be. They like focusing on that way more than they like the idea of just being humble servants and loving people. So I definitely want to do a deeper dive on Paul. If you are interested in that and interested in hearing my thoughts and theories on Paul, who he was, what his intents and motives were, let me know in the comments and I might make a video on that in the future. I have a lot of strong opinions, some perhaps a bit more conspiratorial than others. <laughs> I, you know, don't necessarily fully fall into the camp that Christianity was, uh, you know, made up by the Romans as a tool for, you know, oppression and control. Although I think it's possible the Roman government might have taken some opportunities with the spread of early Christianity and, and, and maybe Paul was a part of that. That's just my personal opinion that a lot of people will disagree with. You know, we all have our, our own thoughts and ideas and I have some very strong thoughts and ideas on Paul. So maybe in the future I will make a video and share those with you and we can kind of discuss those a little bit further. And maybe you guys can provide some insight that I haven't considered. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget about my merch shop, jezebelvibes.com slash merch. I will link it in the description. Also, you can follow me on TikTok at christy.burke. It's where I share a lot of my hot takes. I get a little snarky over there and you know, we have a little bit more fun. You can follow me over there if you wanna see more of my content. And as always, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, ring the bell, do the things. If you like my content, you wanna support it. Those are ways that you can really help me and help my channel grow. We are growing at a pretty rapid rate. As I make this video, we're right around 20,000 subscribers, which is crazy to me because, um, you know, I posted videos about a year ago. I posted about three, maybe four, and then I didn't post for about 10 months. <laughs> and then I kind of came back full force and it's been, it's been great. I've gotten so much support here. There's been really great conversations. Uh, I get a lot of hate comments, but you know what, if you're leaving hate comments, you're helping boost my content and helping people who need to see it see it. So I thank you no matter what comment you leave because you are helping me and helping my purpose here, which is to just reach people who are questioning their faith, who are confused, who have walked away and just need a place to hear somebody else sort out all these things that they've been thinking about. So I hope that this video helped you. I hope maybe you gained something from it and uh, I'll see you next time.